Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to move right along with the next part of Unit 4, Section 9, which is about redox reactions. In the last video, we looked at uh, the most common types of redox reactions, which are metals being reacted with metal ions. In this video, we're going to start by looking at reactions of halogens. Now, like we said last time, we normally oxidize metals. Well, nonmetals tend to be reduced. They have their elemental... Uh, state which has a charge of course of zero and then they tend to go down in charge which means that they have to gain electrons which is a reduction. Now there's an activity series for halogens and if you look at this activity series you'll see that it's basically synonymous with the halogen group just written out from top to bottom on group 17 of the periodic table. And the way this works is that halogens on this activity series can be reduced by the ions that are underneath them on the list. So that makes it rather, uh, rather simple for us to keep that straight. So for example, if we have F2 fluorine gas being reacted with bromine ions, well, we see that yes, that's going to work because fluorine can be reduced by pretty much any other halogen because uh, fluorine is on top. So yeah, we're going to have fluoride and then bromine is going to be the other product. Of course, you want to balance that like this. On the other hand, if you have bromine liquid being added to uh, chloride ions, well, notice that here's, here's bromine and chloride is above it. So that's a no reaction since uh, a halogen cannot be reduced by the ions that are above it on that hierarchy there. Let's take a look at this one. How about bromine liquid being added to iodide ions? Well, that one is going to work, isn't it? Because bromine is here, iodide ions are underneath, so we're going to make bromide ions, Br negative, and then iodine solid, which is I2. And of course, you want to balance that equation. So let's try an example. Let's say we have pure chlorine gas that is bubbled into a solution of potassium iodide. Well, the first thing you want to realize is that the potassium is the spectator this time. So chlorine gas is Cl2, and it's going to react with iodide ion. So that's I negative. So of course, potassium, that doesn't have anything to do with this. So what is chlorine going to turn into? Well, the other form of chlorine that we know of is chloride. So we'll have two chloride ions produced. And then in the other half reaction here, the iodide is going to be converted into iodine in its elemental form. So very similar to how the metals and the metallic ions work. They basically uh, swap states for all practical purposes, for lack of a better term. The, the elemental uh, uh, form is going to turn into the ionic form. And the one that's an ion is going to turn into the elemental form. Now, of course, we have to balance these half reactions. I put a two right there. And on this one, we have a charge of zero as opposed to a charge of negative two. So to balance the first half reaction, I need two electrons on the left side to make that work out. And then on the other one, we have negative two here versus zero. So two electrons go on the right side this time. So since the first one is gaining electrons, that's reduction. And since the second one here is losing electrons, we call that oxidation. Well, now we're ready to add these half reactions together. And we notice that the two electrons will basically disappear once we add these together. So this is OK to add together. And so here is our overall balanced equation. We have chlorine gas and two iodide ions reacting to produce two chloride ions and iodine solid. So that's how you would work a problem with a halogen that is redox as well. Now, there are a lot of uh, miscellaneous redox reactions that you need to be aware of. Some of these are just simple synthesis reactions that you probably learned how to write in a first year chemistry class. If you have pure elements that are uh, combining or they're reacting with each other to make a compound, that's a redox reaction. If you have an element burned, that means it's being reacted with oxygen, that's a redox reaction as well, and you need to be aware of how that works. So for example, if we have a piece of sodium metal that's placed into a beaker containing pure chlorine gas, well, you need to know that the sodium metal is Na, 
in its elemental state. And the pure chlorine gas is Cl2. Don't forget that it's diatomic, so we have to write it as Cl2. And when you put those together, you make the ionic compound sodium chloride, which hopefully you know is written as NaCl. Now, notice this is solid. This is not ionic. The reason for that is because there is no water that's mentioned in the question. So NaCl has to be solid. It's not solution. So we just write it like this. Of course, you have to balance the equation. We can balance the chlorine atoms and then the sodium atoms. And now we have a balanced equation. And hopefully, you can look at that and see that the sodium is being uh, oxidized and the chlorine is being reduced. How about this one? How about iron filings and sulfur flowers are heated together vigorously in a crucible? So in this case, we have iron. So that is Fe solid. And then we have sulfur, which is S solid. And if it's heated together vigorously, they're going to form an ionic compound. So that compound is going to be FES. In the next example, we have a strip of magnesium metal is burned in air. So once again, we have magnesium metal, which is just Mg solid. And anytime you burn something, when you burn something in air, you're always reacting it with oxygen gas. And so the other reactant would be O2. So that's what burning in air means. Now, the ionic compound that's formed from this will be, of course, magnesium oxide. And you'll write that as MgO because magnesium is a plus 2 and oxide is a minus 2. When you balance that, you have uh, balance the magnesiums and the uh, oxygens like that. And so now we have the overall balanced equation. And of course, you can look at this and see that magnesium is being oxidized and the oxygen gas is being reduced. How about sulfur is burned in air? Same type of deal. This time we have sulfur, S solid, and burning in air means it's being reacted with O2. And so the product uh, sometimes is not obvious. In this case, it's just sulfur dioxide for the most part. And that's the balanced equation. That's all you have to, to write. So uh, you can take a look at that, a redox reaction right there. How about a piece of sodium metal is burned in air? Same type of problem here. We have sodium metal this time, sodium solid. And we're burning it in air, so that's O2 being added to that. And so the ionic compound that's produced from this combination is going to be sodium oxide. And the formula for that is Na2O because, of course, sodium is a plus 1 and oxide is a minus 2, so you have to swap the charges. Now, when you balance the equation, it looks like we have to balance the oxygens like this, and then we have 4 sodium, so a 4 goes over here. So that's how you write these miscellaneous uh, redox reactions, that many of which you'll find are actually synthesis reactions. Now, we're going to take a look at a special type of reaction here, a disproportionation reaction. Now, this is a special type of redox reaction in which you'll find that the same element is actually being oxidized and reduced at the same time. Now, maybe you're wondering, how in the world can that happen? Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Let's say we have a piece of copper metal is dropped into a solution of copper to sulfate. So we know that copper and copper two have to be reacting in this in this process here because in the most common redox processes metals are going to react with metal ions and that's what we have here we have copper that's the metal and of course copper two is the metal ion so we're going to have uh, those as the reactants and in one of these cases the copper is going to be oxidized in the other case the copper two ions will be reduced. The neat thing about this is the product in each of these cases will be the same ion. So can you think of a form of copper that has a charge in between zero and positive two? Well, there's only one possibility, right? It has to be copper with a positive one charge. And that's what both of these forms of copper will turn into. So you'll have you know, this copper at the plus two, copper zero, and they meet in the middle. So it's kind of a, I guess, a, a convergence of these two charges. And to balance these, we need to have a, an electron over here. And in the second one, we will we'll need to have an electron over here. So once again, we can add these together. 
and you'll, you'll notice that the, the single electron will disappear once we add these together. So in the overall balanced equation, it's copper metal plus a copper two plus ion yields two copper one ion. The copper is being oxidized, the copper two ions are being reduced. So that's a disproportionation reaction. Now, we can do one that's uh, somewhat different from this. This is also disproportionation. This says a solution of iron two chloride is allowed to stand in a beaker for several months. Now, you might look at that question and say, well, what, what, what in the world's going on here? It doesn't look like there's much of a reaction. But as it turns out, in this case, it's the iron two that's reacting essentially with itself. And that means that the iron two has to be both oxidized and reduced. So in this case, we're just gonna write iron two plus as the reactant in both of the half reactions. And can you think of two other forms of iron, maybe one that's higher than iron two plus and one that's lower than iron two plus? Well, if you think about the ion chart and how we've had some experience with iron and some of these elements, you probably know that iron two plus can become just regular iron metal. It can be reduced. And so that's one of the products. And then there's another form of iron that has a charge higher than two plus. It's, it's iron three plus. And so in this case, we have the uh, charges that are actually uh, diverging. We have both that start out at iron two, one goes up to plus three, one goes down to zero. So now we just have to balance these. We're gonna need, it looks like two electrons on the left side over here. And then in the second half reaction, we're gonna need one electron on the right side. So now we're ready to add these up. We are gonna have to multiply equation number two by two, aren't we, to make those two electrons disappear whenever we add them to each other. So we're gonna to have to do this. And now we're ready to add the half reaction. So our overall balanced equation is three iron two ions yield iron metal plus two iron three plus ions. So uh, in this case, we see that the iron two ions are being uh, reduced. And in the second one, these, these iron two ions are actually being oxidized. So there are some disproportionation reactions. And if you get some practice with this, you'll find that uh, once you know what to look for, they're not that hard to do, as you can see. Now, generally speaking, in order for a disproportionation reaction to work, an element must have at least three oxidation states. So that's why transition metals are very common for these types of, of reactions, because in the case of iron, just as an example, you have two ion forms as well as one elemental form. You have iron two plus, iron three plus, and then just plain old iron metal. And that's the way it, it works with copper as well. You have copper one, copper two, and, and just copper metal. So that's why transition metals are the most common cases with these disproportionation reactions. Now, there's one last example that I'd like to share with you about these special cases of uh, redox reactions, and that's metals reacting with most strong acids. Usually, when you react a metal with a strong acid, you're gonna get hydrogen gas as the product that is actually produced from those hydrogen positive ions. Now, I'm gonna leave out nitric acid. In the next video, we'll actually see what happens to nitric acid. It, it actually doesn't work like this. Nitric, nitric acid is a special case. But let's try an example where we have a piece of iron metal is dropped into hydrobromic acid. Well, you see iron metal, so that's our, our Fe, and so we write that down. You want to remember that anytime you have a strong acid and a, a redox reaction, the only important part of the strong acid that we actually care about would be the H+. The uh, bromide in the hydrobromic acid is just a spectator ion. So we're not gonna worry about that. So the iron is going to be oxidized as most metals will do. And you know, the most common form of that in solution is iron two plus. And then H plus, we said, well, that's gonna produce hydrogen gas. So that's gonna be H2. And then of course we need to, to balance these. So two electrons on the right side here, we'll balance that. On the second half reaction, I need to balance the hydrogen atoms first, and then I can put two electrons over here to balance my plus two versus the zero charge. So put a, a two electrons right there. And now, looks like I'm ready to add these together, and these two electrons will disappear 
when I add them together. So I can see that my overall balanced equation is iron solid plus two hydrogen ions yield iron two plus ions plus hydrogen gas. So these are some special cases with redox. Once again, some of these you have to be on the lookout for, especially some of those disproportionation reactions. But with practice, you'll get pretty good at writing these. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something, that, something from this. If you did, please smash that thumbs up button. And I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to learn how to balance some more complicated redox reactions. Thanks for watching.